All right, we're in Exodus uh, chapter 23 this morning. We're going to pick up in verse 14, Exodus 23, 14. Work, effort, exertion, labor, toil, the daily grind, we call it sometimes, right? What is the number one purpose of work? In its simplest and most basic form, what is the purpose of work? It's to put food on the table. Sure, it will also provide the table. It'll also provide the shelter over the table. Uh, but we've all seen the cardboard signs, right, that say, we'll work for food. Have you ever seen a sign that said, we'll work for a table to put my food on, or we'll work for a place to store my table with my food on it? Work in its most rudimentary form is to provide food, which sustains life. Work in its most rudimentary form sustains life. Yet often people have a negative uh, feeling about work, uh, as you can see by these bumper stickers. You know, the one says, on my way to work, please kill me. Uh, work is a four-letter word. Born to shop, forced to work. And this last one, I would tell you to go to hell, but I work there, and I don't want to see you every day. Uh, terrible ideas about work, of fe people's feelings about work. And many people are under the misunderstanding that work is a result of sin. However, that's not the case at all. That's not what the Bible says. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, we're told, The Lord God planted the garden towards the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he for had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Notice God, the, the Lord God planted and caused the growth that was food for man. God breathed life into the man, and then God provided food to sustain man's life. And then in verse 15 of Genesis 2, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. So before man sinned, God put him in the garden to cultivate it and keep it, so that he could eat from it working for food. However, we do know at this point work was easy until man sinned. So God created and he provided the source of the food. God caused the growth of the food, but God let man play a part in the cultivating and collecting of that food. So fast forward 4,000 years. Jesus miraculously provides food for 5,000 people he walks across the Sea of Galilee, remember, miraculously walking on water, and the crowd finds him on the other side in Capernaum. In John chapter 6, verse 28, Therefore they said to him, the crowd said to Jesus, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? The crowd says they want to do the works of God. And so they ask what that is. And Jesus responds, The work that God has for you is to believe in Jesus. And what's the purpose of work in its most simple and basic and rudimentary form is to provide food in order to sustain life. Jesus basically says, if you're interested in sustaining spiritual life, eternal life, then you need to believe in me, believe in Jesus. And then they ask, what work does Jesus perform? And the work that Jesus would perform would not sustain his own life, but on the contrary, the work that Jesus would perform would be to give up his life in order to provide and sustain their lives, our lives, on, in, on into eternity. Well, they continue this crowd in verse 31 of John 6. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. 
For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. The bread of God, the food of God, is that which came down out of heaven. The food of God is Jesus. Food sustains life. The work of God is to believe in Jesus, the bread of life, which sustains life eternal. What then is our work as believers in Jesus? In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus tells us, all his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So if our work is to make disciples, teaching them all we know about Jesus, does that mean that our work sustains life? We're told in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, <clears throat> What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. So Paul's writing this. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Just like with Adam, God allowed him to cultivate and keep the garden. But God planted it, right? And God caused the growth. In the same way, God has allowed us to play a part. He allows us to cultivate and keep his spiritual garden. Paul says that we are God's field. Yet the Lord provides the opportunity for each one to come to him. And the, and the Lord provides the spiritual growth in each one. It is the Lord who causes the increase. However, he does allow us to play a part. And each of us will receive a, a reward according to how we play that part. We are God's fellow workers, Paul says, co-workers of God. And what is the rudimentary purpose of work? To put food on the table and therefore sustain life, spiritual life. Are we doing that? Spiritually, are we putting food on the table? Are we putting the bread of life, Jesus, on the table? Are we serving him up to those around us? Well, God designed us to work. And so this should be easy, right? Working is supposed to be easy. In Genesis 3.17, uh, we see what happens with work. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So because man sinned, the ground was cursed. In toil the man would eat all the days of his life. Thorns and thistles, by the sweat of his face he will eat bread. It's interesting that Paul calls us believers in Jesus God's field. And so is there a correlation here? I don't know, but in, in a spiritual sense, the work of God is not necessarily easy, is it? It's a battle. Think about Jesus praying to follow the, God, the Father's will to the point of physically sweating blood. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. God says, thorns and thistles shall grow for you. Work is not the result of sin, but hard work is the result of sin. So for 400 years, the descendants of Israel, the descendants of Jacob, they were slaves. They worked very hard, but they received minimal provision for all their hard work. God frees them from an enslaved life to Egypt. Remember, Egypt represents the world. Through Jesus, God frees us from an enslaved life to the world, enslaved to sin. God tells them through Moses in the beginning of Exodus chapter 23 that they need to not work so hard physically, that they need to take a day off every week, work six days, then take a day off. But you see, they're, they're thinking, you know, we got to put food on the table. 
How are we going to eat on the seventh day if we don't work for food? Not only that, God tells them to take a whole year off of growing food. Plant the field six years and then don't plant the seventh year and don't even harvest it. He says, let the poor people and the wild animals eat the harvest of the field that year. And naturally, the people would be concerned, how are we going to eat for that year? And then God tells them that he will provide such a bountiful harvest on the sixth year that it will provide food for them for, this, for that sixth year and then also for the seventh year that they don't plant and also for the eighth year until the harvest finally comes in from what they do plant. You see, they've been working their fingers to the bone for Egypt and they were barely able to sustain life and it really wasn't even a life worth living. And that's how we are before we allow Jesus to remove us from being slaves to this world. Working our fingers to the bone, barely able to sustain life, and, and really it wasn't even a life worth living. But now they are working for God. We are working for God. And even though the ground is cursed because of man's sin, and work is harder than God originally designed it to be, God tells them to take a day off every week and take a year off of planting every week of years because God is the provider and if God says to take a day off he's gonna provide for that day off and if God says to take a year off of planting he's gonna provide for that year off God says you're not enslaved to Egypt anymore you're not enslaved to the world anymore you're not living a life that's not worth living anymore he says you're serving me now and I'll take care of you I take care of my servants I take care of my children and I'm taking care of you. And I want you to acknowledge that. Not for God's sake. He knows that he is the provider, the creator, the sustainer of life. But God desires for us to acknowledge that fact so that we know where the provision is coming from. So that we don't forget where it's coming from. So we don't forget who it is that we are serving. So God tells the people in Exodus 23, 14, three times of year you shall celebrate a feast to me. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty handed. So God commands the people to celebrate a feast to him three times a year. So God commands them to have a party three times a year, to have a feast, celebrating that feast to God. It kind of makes you think, what is the matter with us people that God has to command us to have a feast for him, to, ha to, to take a break, to have a party? And so God says, the first one is the feast of unleavened bread, bread without yeast, because they didn't have time to let the bread rise on the night that God delivered them out of the hands of Egypt. So God wants them to have a feast starting with the Passover feast on the first day. As we just experienced a few weeks ago, it's a really good feast, full of all kinds of good food. But God wants them to keep the leaven out of the bread that week. Leaven in the Bible represents sin. God wants them to remember that he delivered them out of Egypt, out of the world, out of a life of bondage to sin. And so God wants them to remember all week, every time they eat that bread during this feast, God wants them to remember that it was God that delivered them out of slavery. It was God that provided that freedom. And it is God that has made the provision to even have the very feast that they are celebrating to him. And God says that none should appear before him empty handed. You see, the whole point of the feast is to celebrate God the provider. The God that has allowed them to take a day off every week. The God that has allowed them to take a year off of planting every seven years. The God that is now commanding them to take time off and celebrate with a feast, celebrating God and his provision for them. And since God has provided for them, they certainly should not show up to a celebration of how bountiful God the provider is empty handed. It's again a bit contradictory, right? The thought is if God is really your provider, then where's the provision? If there is provision and they didn't bring it to God, why are they holding back from God? Maybe deep down they really did not view him as the provider. 
Verse 16, also you shall observe the feast of the harvest for the first fruits of your labors from what you sow in the field, also the feast of the ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in the fruit of your labors from the field. John Corson writes, the people of God were to gather three times a year for the feast of Passover in the spring, for the feast of harvest or Pentecost 50 days after Passover, and for the feast of ingathering or tabernacles in the fall. And when they gathered, none were to come empty-handed. Rather, they were to come ready to give. There are people today who come to the assembly not looking for something to get, but something to give. They come prayed up, prepared to worship, eager to tithe, ready to reach out to someone, and in doing so, they enrich the fellowship greatly. John Corson. Verse 17, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the fat of my feast to remain overnight until morning. You shall bring the choice first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. You are not to boil a young goat in the milk of its mother. Since leaven represents sin, it was not to be offered in conjunction with the blood of the sacrifice. The blood of the lamb alone on Passover is what caused the angel of death to pass over their homes, right? They painted the blood. That was it. It wasn't a combination of the people's best efforts and then the blood made up the difference that they lacked. No, it was the blood alone. And so too with Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God says, don't offer up your leaven, the best efforts of your sinful nature in conjunction with my shed blood. It's really an insult to God. Then God says to bring the good stuff, not the leftovers. Don't collect up all the apples that are bruised up that you weren't going to eat anyway and bring them to God. Again, it's contradictory to celebrate God the provider by bringing the garbage you're not even willing to eat to him. And now this statement in verse 19, that you're not to boil a young goat in the milk of its mother. It's believed that this was a ritual or fertility rite of the Canaanites or those that were in the land. Uh, the people that were living in this land that God had given to the Hebrews. Some suggest that they would use the milk, which was provided to sustain life, and they would end the life of the young goat by boiling it in it. And then they would take that milk and they would sprinkle it in the field after the harvest, hoping that the next year's harvest would be more bountiful. Well, because these feasts are to celebrate God the provider, who provides a bountiful harvest, so bountiful it will cover a year without planting. So if the Hebrews were to follow this superstition of the Canaanites, it might cause some confusion to who the real provider is, right? Is it God or is it this special milk that we sprinkled on the field? As ridiculous as that sounds. So God instructs them not to do this. Don't be like the Canaanites. Don't be like the world. And certainly today there are all sorts of superstitions that people relate to physical provision from you know fortune cookies to itchy palms you know bring money or whatever there's all kinds of crazy things now it's believed that the custom of the orthodox jew to not eat meat and dairy products together comes from this very verse in trying to follow the letter of the law instead of the intent of the law which was to not be like the canaanites they speculated in the minute possibility of a person eating a meal that had dairy products in it and meat in it. That it would be possible that the meat came from the offspring of the animal that supplied the milk for the dairy products and together in a person's stomach as it digests the food together or on the stove as they are cooking it together, you know, butter and meat, there's a remote possibility that they would violate the letter of this law without even knowing it. And they think that would be bad, right? So to avoid this extremely remote possibility, the Orthodox Jews do not eat meat and dairy products together. Even if the meat's from a chicken and the dairy products from a cow, which obviously there can be no relation, uh, better safe than sorry is the way they're thinking. The kitchen in an Orthodox Jew's home, you will find one set of utensils for dairy products and one set for meat products. 
just in case it went through the dishwasher and there was a molecule of dairy on the spoon and they used it to cook the meat and it combined in the pan, you could be in violation of God's command in their minds. They've taken this one verse and created a whole lifestyle around it. But all they had to do was turn back one book in the Bible to Genesis chapter 18. In Genesis 18, verse 1, Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre. Notice the Lord is in all caps. It means YHWH, Yahweh, or Jehovah. This is God the Father. The Lord appeared to him, Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Verse 5, And I will bring you a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that you may go on, and since you have visited your servant. And they said, So do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd, and he took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. He took curds, which is butter, and milk, and the calf, which he had prepared, and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Abraham serves dairy products and meat to God the Father himself, or and these angels, and they ate it. This is why it's so critical to understand Scripture in context. Really, to understand any form of communication by anybody, it needs to be read in context. You know, the media does this all the time. They take one part of one sentence that someone said, and all by itself, it's terrible. Like someone says, never do I curse at drivers in traffic, and the media puts dot, dot, dot in place of never do. So it says, dot, 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 I curse at drivers in traffic. Pastor John Doe or whatever. You can turn anything to anything, you know, to make anything out of context. The context of verse 19 in Exodus 23 is celebrating three feasts a year to God the provider. So naturally in that context, the intention of God was that his people would not partake in some Canaanite superstition that could possibly give, be given credit for the Hebrews' provision. It has nothing to do with eating meat and dairy products together. Obviously, God is not opposed to it since Abraham served it up to God himself or the pre-incarnate Christ, and he ate it in Genesis 18. And speaking of pre-incarnate appearances of Christ, which just means pre-physical body. Do you remember John chapter 1? John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not a God, as Monica pointed out earlier to the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And then you go down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word is Jesus, the Son, the begotten Son. So God the Son existed from the beginning with God the Father. And we see a lot of instances in the Old Testament, just like this, and these angelic beings, uh, we see. And we see so many instances where angels are able to materialize to, a, to uh, what appears to be a physical body. I don't know exactly if it's actually made up of molecular structure, but they think it's a physical body people that see this in the Bible. So we believe that God the Son is able to do this as well before he was put into the womb of Mary. And so Genesis 18 is believed to be one of these appearances of God the Son. And also here in Exodus chapter 23, starting in verse 20, God says, Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and bring you into the place which I had prepared. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, 
for he will not pardon your transgression, since my name is in him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be your enemy, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. So this angelic being that God speaks of is able to pardon transgression or forgive sins. God's name is in him. And did you notice he said, if they obey his voice, then they are doing what God says. And so you can see why it is believed that this is an appearance of God the Son. Verse 23, for my angel will go before you bringing and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. You shall not worship their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their deeds, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their sacred pillars in pieces. Verse 25, but you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from your midst. There shall be no one miscarrying or barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion all the people among whom you come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. Verse 28, I will send hornets ahead of you so that they will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites before you. I will not drive them out before you in a single year that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. Verse 31, I will fix your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of Philistines and from the wilderness to the river Euphrates for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you will drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them or with their gods. They shall not live in your land because they will make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. After God says that his angel will go before them and bring them into this land that God has promised them. So after stating that this angel, angel or God the Son is going to be before them and bring them into this land, then nine times God says, I will. I will. God makes it extremely clear that he has not left his people, the Hebrew people, alone in this endeavor. He has not told them, hey, go take that land over so God could sit back and watch and see what happens. No, God states he is going to bring them into the land and that he will completely destroy their enemies so that they will serve him, the true and living God. And God will remove the sickness and disease from them. God will remove the problems with pregnancy, including becoming pregnant. God will let them all live full lives, the full number of their days. God says that he will cause the enemies to be terrified of the Hebrews, to be confused by the Hebrews. God says he will cause them to retreat and flee from the Hebrews. God says he will use hornets, flying insects, to drive out the enemies of the Hebrews. And then God states that he will not do it all at once because if the land is unoccupied by humans, it'll be overrun with wild animals. Remember, lions and those things live over there. God says that he will set their boundaries or borders of their land. God states that he will deliver the enemy into the hands of the Hebrews. And then God gives the reason why he does not want his people, the Hebrews, living amongst the Canaanites. God says that these other people groups will cause the Hebrews to sin against God. And God says, if you serve their gods, it'll be a snare to you. A snare, a trap, a noose around their necks. God does not call us to separate ourselves from the world. You know, how could we do the work that God has called us to do? The work that Jesus has commanded us to do making disciples throughout the world. How could we do that if we are separated from the world, completely removed from it? Uh, as I heard one pastor state it, he says the boat needs to be in the river, but you can't have the river in the boat. Because when you get the river in the boat, the boat sinks. So we need to be in the world, in the neighborhood, in the schools, in the stores, in the workforce, but we need to be careful not to let the world get into us. And just like God would lead the Hebrews, 
into the land little by little, so too the world can get into us little by little, so that we don't even realize that our boat is filling up with water and it's about to sink. We want to be careful with that. Another example is God, as God leads the Hebrews into this land little by little, he, he's sanctifying us, preparing us, perfecting us little by little until we can fully take possession of the life he has for us. Remember, we are God's fellow workers, we were told. Co-workers of God. And what was the rudimentary purpose of work? To put food on the table and therefore sustain life, even spiritual life. So let me encourage you this morning to be doing that. Spiritually putting food on the table, putting the bread of life, Jesus on the table and serving him up to those around you. You know, it may sound like a daunting task, a difficult task. But remember, Philippians 2.13, it says, For God, or for it is God, who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being our God. We thank you for uh, encouraging us to celebrate you and your provision for us, Lord. You've not commanded us to follow these feasts to the, to the rule like you did the Hebrew people, Lord, but certainly you do want us to celebrate your provision and, and offer to you our, our gratitude for you providing for us. Lord, I just ask that you be with us this week, that you help us to remember that you are the provider, you are our provider. And Lord, that you would help us to allow you to work in and through us for your will, for your work, for your good pleasure, Lord. Allow us to be that field that provides that spiritual food, Lord, that you provide the spiritual food through to the rest of the world. So, Lord, use us in powerful ways in our lives, in work, at the store, in the neighborhood, with anybody we encounter, Lord. Help us to make ourselves available to you. Give us the courage, the power, the strength to follow your will, your leading, and just to lay it out there, Lord. Lay that food out on the table for the world to eat. Lord, be with us. Fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.